Sure, sure. I'm sorry. Hey, Guru Nation. Thank you so much for watching and listening. This is a special one, okay? Christina the Archangelo, for those that might be hardcore fans, I think it was 2018, 2017, we did a podcast. Christina's been in the CBT space. She owns a CRO. Affinity Bio Partners is the name. She's the CEO. She's got a boutique CRO. She's up to all kinds of cool stuff. She's a mover and shaker in the industry. Um, unconventional, anti-establishment, to say the least. And um, I think it takes that kind of uh, personality to do to be in the niches that you're in. Uh, there's a lot of research that needs to be done in those in those areas. And she has her own podcast as well. I was on it. We'll have the link underneath this video and in the show notes to her LinkedIn. And then from there, you can get to all her different websites and portals. But Christina, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me on again. It's like been years since we talked. And I was so honored when you came on my show, which was one of the, you know, we had an amazing time when we shot that. My my producer was really happy with the content because we came from the pure heart space of patient safety and efficacy and worrying about how we enroll patients properly. So I was so honored that we decided to um, have another chat on your show now again yeah. to talk about you know what we've all been up to and and where what does the space look like now? It's you been know, a while. What is everybody doing? <laughs> it's been a while. I guess let's start with like the current event, maybe a good icebreaker. Um, CVS, CVS pulled the plug on their clinical research. Maybe it was like two, three years. I don't know exactly when they started, but it wasn't that long. They pulled the plug. Um, mm -hmm. What do you, what is, what is your takeaway from that? So this was very interesting to see that they pulled the plug because <laughs> CVS, right? So people, where, where are we getting our prescriptions when we go to pick them up? A lot of times it's a CVS, a Walgreens and all those places, right? And so it's very odd to me that they would pull the plug on research when they in fact have drugs that they're giving to patients that went through clinical trials and are approved for, you know, that have been researched. Why okay. wouldn't they want to stay in this space? Because they would then become full circle, right? Well, as I guess the as... real the real question, maybe to get the answer, the real question, and I've never talked about this with anyone, actually. Um why do you think they got into this space to begin with? They don't need the extra revenue stream from running sites. I mean it's nice for a small business. Maybe it's nice even for some private equity if you can have a network of sites. But it's even at its largest, most scalable form, it's not going to be attractive for CVS on its own. No. And the cost of research. That's what I'm wondering as to why they decided to step out. Because the cost of research to run these studies and run them properly um, and design the best protocols that you can so that you're meeting your necessary endpoints. So when you mess up and you have to go back to the drawing board and those things, I'm wondering if there was something to do with the whole financials involved and the amount of money that was involved in them participating in this advantage point, because the industry has imploded, right? Pharmaceuticals, right. biotech. I mean, everything is not the same from what we talked back in the day. To where we are today right we're watching right. stuff happen constantly so was it a money situation was there a problem with how they were operating <laughs> you know did someone discover something and they decided hey you know what i'm out mm -hmm. we're not going to do this anymore we're really not into this anyway it's hard like, to imagine they didn't do their due their due diligence before they invested in this initiative i mean it's cvs i'm sure they even share board members with big pharma mm -hmm. for a fact i haven't looked into it but if probably somebody who's interested can just research the board members of cvs and take the top 20 big pharma yeah. guarantee you almost can guarantee you there's going to be some common names on mm -hmm. different boards fda ex fda people not even you know, getting potentially, into that, but yeah. You yeah. know, because look, 
look, I'm going to say it. Okay. I'm just going to open up the can here. That's why I, I like to have you on. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when I got into the cannabis space and we're treading, you know, very carefully, you know, a lot of the stuff we do in traditional, I brought forward into the cannabis space. And when the ex-FDA got leave left and then went to go work for Pfizer, yep. I'm like, and now you're talking about cannabis. Do you remember the in the beginning when he would talk badly about cannabis? Yep. yep. And then Pfizer, what did they do a couple of years ago, right? When they acquired a, Arena with all the money they made off of the vax and everything else that they were doing. Mm-hmm. And so when that happened, everybody was dying, right? The people that don't really understand research like we do, the traditionals, right? That are in the right. space. Everybody was freaked out about it. Well, I didn't care. Because I was like, listen, people, they had to pay for something. They had to invest something, right? They had a lot of money. So they bought Arena. Let's think about this. Did they buy Arena because they want to extend their patent life on some of their drugs then? Because Arena is synthetic-based cannabis. Right, right. Right? Right. So everybody was freaked out. I don't work in that space, synthetic. I stay in the natural side. So for me, I didn't give a crap. I'm like, whatever. Who cares? Mm -hmm. But anyway, to your point on the CVS thing, were there people involved? that are ex-FDA, where their regulators involved in this whole business? What's going on and who's gonna look into this? Because it's very odd. I saw it hit LinkedIn. I don't know if that's how you saw it, but I saw it hit LinkedIn and I was like, what? Yeah. And I think I read it like, I don't even know because I was moving. So it was in between the move. I was on my phone for a brief moment and I read it and I was like, what is going on? <laughs> well, I know on the surface, see with these companies, you gotta look between the lines. like. On the surface, they said, oh, it's to to improve access to clinical trials, to bring research as a care option, all this stuff that people want to hear, you know, inclusivity, diversity. I mean, all things we need, but that was their stated reason. But there's must be a, like a another reason <laughs> to try Did to you do see this. A, I didn't see a big push for their clinical trials division at CVS. Did you? I mean, we're pretty tapped in. I didn't see a lot of stuff. I was on around. a panel with it was either CVS or Walgreens, and they're okay. both. They're both. Well, Walgreens probably still in it, but I was on a panel at DIA last year, a virtual one, and there was one you know, a member from either CVS or Walgreens. I can't remember that was there. So they were making a push, like at least at conferences and especially on the whole inclusivity front, the DE&I initiatives. Um, that was like their why to the public of why they're doing this and also their why to big pharma. But it doesn't make sense. If that's your why, like it's worth more than a two-year investment to actually pull that off. Like why not give it five years? Why, why pull the plug? And you know, two years. Right, right. That just doesn't make sense. And from a patient standpoint, okay, because I go to CVS for my prescriptions, mm. like, and we're educated patients. So we've got a little bit of a competitive edge to, you know, people who don't work in this space that are just getting their prescriptions at the CVS. How do people feel about this? Like, how do okay. these patients feel about the fact that now where they get their prescriptions, either it's, well, you know, wherever they're getting, if they're getting a CVS, right? How do they feel about the fact that now they don't want to invest in research, but yet you're getting your medicines from them that are backed by research from other people yeah. who paid for it, right? They didn't pay for it. I mean, that's the thing. The majority of the patients probably are not even aware that this was ever a thing. And they probably, I'm sure they enrolled a few patients here and there in some registry studies. And, and you know what else I'm wondering? Did it have something to do with the supply chain problems that we're having right now? with the Mets, right? I know, I don't know if this is happening to you in Arizona, but here in Pennsylvania, I get text messages from CBS every month. Do you want me to refill your Flonase, right? Because I have asthma, yes or no. And you know, I say yes. And then they go, oh, okay, we're gonna fill it. Then if you say no, they go, okay, well, good. Because sometimes they don't have it. They don't have the medicine, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of supply chain issues with anxiety drugs, uh, uh, Mucinex. Do you remember when people couldn't get Mucinex and and it was it, everybody was buying yeah. it on Amazon yeah. and all this stuff because you couldn't get Mucinex when you went to the CVS uh -huh. or wherever you were going. So is there something that we don't know that's relative to supply chain that's impacted? I, 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 there's just something that had to have yeah, happened. Yeah, something just off. Doesn't... We don't have all the info. 
um, even us insiders. And there's another group on LinkedIn that are other site owners, you know, a bunch of site owners are on LinkedIn saying, Hey, I told you so I could have, I could have predicted this, saved you guys millions. Um, but it sucks for the employees, you know, I mean, they went yeah. on a hiring blitz and now all these guys are just let off and laid off. And, you know, we've had layoffs across the board in pharma, right? So there's a lot of people without work right now. So, you know, what what are they doing to our economy? <laughs> you know, how many more people are now in the workforce that are unemployed? Yeah. And do you think what? someone like someone that owns a CRO? It, I'm sure you are familiar with the care access fiasco as well. Yeah. Um, smaller scale but probably the same good old boys club behind the growth of that company yeah. um <laughs> and it's inevitable implosion if you see an a candidate you know for your cro that has cvs or care access on their resume i mean in some ways and it's unfortunate but it's like a scarlet letter like mm. you almost don't want these people like you may interview them yeah, just out but, of curiosity. <laughs> yeah, you may interview them, but and who knows? Maybe like every now and then you'll find like a diamond in the rough that say, "Hey, I just got caught up." But before that, I was a coordinator at a traditional side, and you know, they're it's, still employable, but it's yeah. certainly not a good thing to have that on your resume. No, and it's like you know, think about when some of the big top CROs blew up, right? And they were merging with each other and then things were falling downhill. People were pulling sponsors or pulling contracts. You know what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. And we would get those CVs for those individuals, right? And there yeah. were certain companies, if I got CVs for anybody that was working at any of those companies, I would even entertain it because I knew that they weren't trained the way they needed to be trained. And that's why they were let go. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I don't have time, you know, especially because they want to get paid. <laughs> what kind of I people know do you hire like... Do you hire CRAs? Do you hire data managers? Do you have mm -hmm. the whole CRO spectrum of I, jobs? Yeah, we have the whole spectrum. We have biostatisticians. We have data managers. We have lead CRAs. We have CRAs. Huh. We have project managers, associate project managers. Um, the only thing that we don't, I'm trying to think, because we have tech. Spectrum. Medical monitor. You have medical monitor. We have, oh yeah, we have medical monitoring. There are people. Um, safety. I have Two safety people. people yeah. mm -hmm. So I have all in regulatory. You know, I tap. So every you guys hire for for every position. Yeah. That exists that at the Sierra level. What kind of person do you look for? Like, um, what's your ideal candidate well, I, for these different? I always kind of, So I don't always hire people that on paper make sense. And I know that may sound weird, but if you look at how I started in the industry, right? I don't even have a science degree. Mm -hmm. I have a bachelor's in, in, in BA, right? It's been a while. Uh, Maybe refresh people's memory how you, we'll have the link yeah. to the old interview, but yeah, there's a so, whole new audience here. It was just like an amazing opportunity. I was a young kid, you know, 21, 22 years old. I interviewed for a CRO. I was working as a mergers and acquisition paralegal because I have a paralegal degree as well. Uh -huh. And I happened to be working in the downstairs, one of the downstairs offices to a three-story building. And it was, um, I'm sorry, I was working on the top floor but the CRO was on the bottom floor. One of our admins from the uh, legal firm went down to work for the CRO. He, she actually went to go work for the CEO, Ken Burrow. Wow. Um, it was Covalent Group at the time. And then they they changed into somebody else, it, Inquorium or something. I forget what the, the name was. Okay. So, yeah. So she went down there and they were interviewing in the finance department. And they needed someone to negotiate site contracts and work on some of the master agreements with the sponsors. But you sat in the finance department. I didn't know what any of these acronyms meant. I had no idea what the hell she was talking about. I knew like Pfizer, J and J, those things because they had medicine and you see them on TV. And I had a sick grandpa. So I knew that, you know, there were certain things he was taking and stuff, whatever. So I interviewed in the finance department with the corporate controller and the CFO and the CEO. 
CEO and the clinical head there, VP of clinical and VP of data management. And I admitted I didn't know anything about really what it was that they did, but I had certain skills that were applicable to the work they needed from me because I've been doing legal work for uh, you know a couple of years now. So, and they took a chance and hired me, and that's how I started. So I look for, like you said, the diamond in the rough. That's who I look for. So, like for example, I just hired someone for business development for the tech company Spectral. She does not have a tech background. I don't care about that. What I care about is, can she sell? Can she connect with people? Can she help them? Can she make sure that they understand that we are loyal, that we're here to help? You know what I mean? Uh -huh. It's a little different than a typical salesperson, right? I look for all the soft skills that someone has. Yeah. And also the hard skills of being able to sell, right? Right. Because I don't hire like salespeople, like that are sales, you know what I'm saying? Like the diamond club people, those people, I don't want them. I want people that are relatable to the other human side on the other side of the table. So that's why I'm saying I don't hire conventionally. I see something, I go after it, I pluck it. And then, you know what I mean? And that's how they join my, my, you know, my company. What about like, one. biz dev, you know, the sales, it's an easier transition, I guess. What about mm -hmm. like when you kind of have to lean on experience a bit, or maybe you don't for CRA or position oh, like that? Yeah, CRAs, I've got to have somebody that has at least some CRA experience. I really don't care where they've come from as long as they haven't worked in bad places that I know are bad places, right? <laughs> what well, would be bad? Um, like an example, like there's some places that will brand you with a scarlet letter, right? Well, yeah, like, you know, back in the day, like I referenced, like some of these CROs when they were imploding, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I don't want to say who they are. But no, you know no, what I'm we talking don't need about. The, the like, big ones. Like enemies, yeah. Yeah, but like, I don't you know, want... but, but why? You already know these companies have a bad culture and yes. bad systems. And so you just refuse to deal with anyone from them. I, I refuse to, for the most part, because a lot of times I get hired to come in and fix what these CROs messed up too. Yeah. So there was um, one so of my So what clients... advice can we give to someone like, I mean, not to pick on care access. I don't know anything about them other than what's been in the headlines, but this, they went on a hiring spree, right? And mm -hmm. they hired people entry level. So if you're someone looking to get into research, you're thinking, great, you know, even if it doesn't work out, I could go work somewhere else. Like how does a job, seeker no good and bad culture it's tough like it's luck it's, a little bit of luck just, it, it is and you know stuff is hidden right um the, <laughs> you don't know until you walk through the door so to speak right like how messed up things are and you're like holy cow so like for example i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about something that happened to me in my career when i was on the west coast i started working for threshold pharmaceuticals so First, I went out to work for PDL, who got bought by Abbott. So I was out there working for them, and I was in outsourcing, right? And I was working on like uh, PMF stuff and all kinds of stuff, right? Well, I had an opportunity to pick up a head of outsourcing for a job at Threshold Pharmaceuticals, which Threshold was one of my clients when I worked at PPD. And that was where I came from when I went to the West Coast because I, I left J&J, went down to PPD on purpose. Yeah. I did that on purpose because I wanted to learn and I knew this was the best place to learn. So I went down there when I felt like I had learned what I wanted to learn. I wanted to go back into sponsor life because that's really where I spent, you know, I, I like to spend my time. So I went to work out there. So here I start at Threshold and they had a BPH, BPH drug, which I knew about. Right. Because I worked for PPD and mm -hmm. I knew about what they were doing. So I felt like I had some comfort. Right. So I joined the company. I was there. I don't know. I think it was a week. And what happened was they had a, a failure with the BPH drug and they had to start doing the rescue. And it was worldwide. And mm -hmm. PPD was the CRO. Yeah, at the time and it wasn't ppd's fault i'm not blaming ppd it had nothing to do with ppd there was other issues right so here i'm and i report directly to 
clinical, the clinical vice president. The clinical vice president had people reporting to me in clinical because I was the most senior person. So I had the TMF people, I had everybody, all the clinical project managers. Now we're rescuing, people aren't getting paid. You know, the, the, the sites weren't getting paid. People aren't releasing the data. It was massive. It was craziness. I got laid off. Mm. <laughs> and so, and then I had to lay everybody else off. So here I leave this stable job at PDL, yeah. you know, where we were doing things and I was, I was doing very well there. I got promoted. I was getting paid well. And it was a good company. I left for growth for, for my career. Yep. Because that's when I became the youngest head of outsourcing in the entire industry was when I went to Threshold because I was 30 some years old, right? Right. It was smart for me to go there. And then I have to worry about severance and how am I going to live in California in the Bay Area? How am I going to afford this? I'm a single person, you know, so I get it. You know what I mean? I get how this, it could look a certain way and then stuff happens. So how did you make it after that? Well, thankfully, I, I clamped down on all of my spending because I was like, oh, my God, I should walk places where I can walk. Do not drive. Do not waste gas. Like, I completely changed my entire way of, of thinking. I was very, very careful on what I was doing financially. And when I was interviewing, I was very selective this time when I was interviewing. So at that time, I interviewed for a Fibrogen and Amgen, okay. which they... They both ended up being competitors of one another because of the HIF um, platform that they both were riding on at that time, uh-huh. Ebogen, right? And then um, 2216, 4592 were the compound numbers for Fibrogen. So I just kept interviewing, inter- you know, like as many. So I ended up having two offers, Fibrogen and Amgen. Amgen, I had to move down to TO, Thousand Oaks. Fibrogen, I could stay where I was. I see. Um, so I, so anyway, I just kept, you know, working to get, to find a job. I ended up finding a job relatively quickly, right? Cause I had those offers and then I was trying to evaluate which offer to take. Should I move to TO? What's the career advancement for me? If I stay at Fibrogen, I could really shine because now I'm coming in again as a head of outsourcing and procurement and. They had a lot of money back then. That's when they raised all that money with Estellas. But you got those two offers right after you got laid off. And... Yeah, about a month and a half after. But mm-hmm. what did you do to get those offers? Like, Or was it some, just something about you? Or like, did you do something specifically? I was, to? Well, I think it was because I was very eager. You know, like I was constantly sending my CV, talking to headhunters. I, see. I have I have friends that are headhunters. because This was before that... LinkedIn. People can do this all on mm-hmm. LinkedIn now. Yeah, now it's LinkedIn, right? Back in the day, we couldn't really use LinkedIn. So it was who you knew. Yeah. And I was brought out to California from North Carolina. And I still had friends, right, that were recruiters who recruited me to California. And so, it, and, and the main guy there was Wes Burwell. And he's one of my very, very good friends now. Hmm. We've been friends since 05, since I was out there in Cali. And I always say, like, he was one of the reasons why I became so successful especially in the Bay area, because he took a chance on me when, you know, he was trying to recruit this position to California. They brought me all the way over from North Carolina. They moved me that all that corporate stuff, but he knew I had stuff that they needed and he knew I could do it. And so, so I stayed in contact with all these guys and they became my friends and family later on. When was it that you got the idea for, Affinity Bio Partners, or to go out on your own? Because um, my first one was Armonia, so that was 2010. Armonia Clinical Research. So I had done a lot of FSP uh, modeling for Fibrogen, uh-huh. and I was working alongside Estellas because we had to share costs with Estellas, right? right? So I was working with the Estellas outsourcing group while I was negotiating, even down to IRB FSPs. <laughs> I mean, I was doing it because <laughs> if you don't control IRB, you're going to spend a lot of money, right? If you don't shut them down, if you don't pay attention, right? right. You know, right? So, mm-hmm. and 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 the CEO at the time, Tom Neff, who's now passed away, he was always worried about money. So my job was really tough doing my job <laughs> with him, and we'd have to have full blown procurement meetings with binders I had to prepare, showing grid analysis, 
negotiated down things, what changed, timelines, all this stuff. I was running these procurements. So you're basically the doing everything and you're thinking, okay, like I can do this for my own. Why shouldn't I do it for myself? Yeah. Why should I not just do this for myself? So that's Do you think I'm that's something that crosses everyone's mind? Because ultimately, I mean, let's take it down to like a small level of a research site, right? Like my job as a site owner is to get my coordinators to behave autonomously and basically operate the business or at least a lot of facets of the business without me. We're not there yet. That's why I'm here a lot, but there eventually we'll get there. Isn't that a risk that, you know what, somebody, another Christina is going to be like, well, I'm doing all this stuff for Dan. Why don't I just do my own? I mean, that, like, it's inevitable that this is going to happen, right? The way I see it, not everyone's entrepreneurial minded anyways, like, like you, for example, but like the, the, the sponsor or the CRO that empowered you to act independently and autonomously they weren't thinking christina's gonna go start her own cro or maybe they were maybe they said hey one out of every 50 will and we're okay with that because it works for the other 49 and and now you have to deal with the same issue as as an owner of a cro mm -hmm. what do you think there's there to unpack like for owners for employees you know i when i hire my people and i you know, across all the companies I have, and they're all different, you know, and they're all, but they're all patient centric, you know, that's the common theme across every, even my brand, you know, is patient centric, people centric. Mm -hmm. Um, I look to improve every single person that joins my team because I know at some point they're going to decide to leave, right? For their own growth. And so I feel as though it's my duty. I just, believe it or not, I just talked about this. It's so funny that you brought this up. Because I just talked about this yesterday because I, I launched a global intern team for the nonprofit, their affinity patient advocacy ambassadors. So I have kids over here in the United States, in the Northeast, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, because you know I'm in Pennsylvania. And then I have my Indian team because my CRO has offices in India. And I have a lot of staff, the EDC, EPRO, the telemonitoring, all those guys with Spectral that are affinity people, they're in India. So this is the first time we ever launched for the nonprofit, a global internship program. I'm wow. really excited about this. And yeah. what, I said, what I said to these kids, and I've got, ten, I have a 10th grader, I've got an 11th grader going into 12, and then I have the 12th grader going into college, right? She yeah. wants to, they're all science-based people, these yep. both sides, except for in India, one of my interns is studying to be an attorney. So I'm really excited about that because of the justice issues as it relates to patient care and all this. This is like, I'm sorry, I'm getting excited. But no, so yeah, when I was, awesome. this is so cool. So when I was talking to these kids yesterday, I said, listen, guys, I'm with you for the long haul as long as you want me to be with you. My job as a mentor is to make sure you always learn something and you always improve on things, right? That you know you want to improve on or things that I might see or somebody else in my team there. That's my job. My job is to be with you as long as you want me to be with, mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it's 10 years down the road and we're still talking, which most of my interns still do, which is amazing because I see them have kids and all this stuff and employees and you know, contractors, whatever. My job is to make their time with me the best it can be. Right. And if they leave, they leave. It's okay. Like, yes, is it a pain in the butt? Surely. I got to try and find them again. Can I find somebody better than them? I don't know. You know what I mean? But yep. we'll make it work because I'm a people-centered leader. I worry about them and I worry about their needs before I worry about myself. Yeah. I have a similar philosophy. That's That's been my um, thesis that I've learned over the years. I mean, in many ways, I'm naturally that way anyways, but I've kind of refined that over the years to really empower the employees. Like if, if you want to go be a CRA, I can help you do that. If you want to be a site director, let's try to make it work here. Mm -hmm. Some are already telling me like at this new company, hey, what about if I started a site? And I tell them, well, yeah, I mean, I could help you do that. Um, here's what it takes. And 
while you're a coordinator, you're going to learn all the ins and outs and see if it's something you still want to do later. <laughs> mm -hmm. A lot of times they change their mind too when they see the reality of what they think they want to do. When you actually let them do some of it, then they say, well, maybe I didn't want to do that after all. Mm -hmm. I've I've experienced a good amount of that mm -hmm. too. So I'm always curious when I get another yeah. business owner, yeah. how they I handle mean, that. I have one intern that's part of this intern group she just wanted to intern for bio partners because she has aspirations of working in clinical research. She's uh, the 10th grade. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was like, okay, so I'm interviewing because I interviewed them all. I don't have anybody else do it. I do it myself. I want to make sure because it's my nonprofit and it's my baby company. You know, it's my, after my dad and now my mom and my brother, all the family know that I had to help over the years with their mm -hmm. issues. So the kid's talking to me about clinical research and stuff like that. And I said, well, I really feel like you need to also intern for affinity patient advocacy, because if you want to be good at research, in my opinion, being in this trajectory, as long as I have been and starting the nonprofit in 15, I learned so much more with my nonprofit patient advocacy firm than I have ever learned working in the clinical research space. Hmm. So you would do yourself a disservice if you didn't learn about the patients, because how can you design studies if you don't really understand the patient profile? Right, right. And the whole the whole industry spiel for the last decade or so has been patient centricity. Mm -hmm. But then they're designing protocols that no patient in their right mind would want to be a part of. Yep. Uh, I mean, we try to say no to a lot of these studies. The crazy. Yeah, like cherry picking and exploratory endpoints um i mean i can go on on a rant but affinity bio partners you guys like what are you excited about uh, on the cro side these days are you still heavy on the cannabinoids we're, and yeah we're really 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 heavy on the cannabinoids and the nutraceutical space mm. um so out there in press i'm not saying anything confidential you'll see that we were working with a company called media life on um, COVID treatment in the DR, but also in the US. Um, I filed their um, EUA and I was working along with the administration, all this stuff back in the day. I tend to be more passionate about working with the nutraceutical based companies because I'm seeing more advanced, less side effects, more advancement um, yeah. in treatment and patient care. And I also feel like those companies really respect people like us, Dan, because we bring a level of rigor of uh, professionalism and our ability to the table that they're learning, right? Nutraceuticals mm -hmm. a little different than what we do, yeah. right? On the on the traditional side, so to speak. What is the nutraceutical but, incentive? Like, because these studies are not cheap. No, And they don't not. really get patent protection, right? Like, I always wonder what's their incentive to... Well, it depends on the compound, right? So like... You know, the, the Escozine that I mentioned, Medialect, those guys, they have patents, right? Because they have a proprietary thing that they developed. It's not cannabinoid related. Um, when you're in the cannabinoid space, you're trying to patent technology, right? Um, because that you can patent. So if it's a transdermal patch company, for example, <laughs> You ha does it does it really work for the 24 hours? Okay, well, if it does work for the 24 hours, why does it work for the 24 hours? Well, because of the technology behind I the patch see. making. So it's the tech behind, like in the case of your natural products. Exactly. The, the delivery system, the platform, not at all dissimilar to what a lot of the traditional biotechs do. They just build platforms as well. Exactly. Exactly. So you see how it was it was an easy like switch for me to come into the space. Was it yeah. like the wild, wild west? Yes, it was. You remember <laughs> when I first got in, it was crazy. People were mad when I got in. Do you remember? Because here I'm trying to bring rigor. Like yeah. stop saying that your CBD works for headaches. You don't freaking know that your CBD works for headaches. But you know what though? Headaches. Like back in like 2018 when this stuff was really hot and, the, and then COVID kind of put a damper on all that stuff. But yeah, it was the Wild West. People were making all kinds of claims. And what's to incentivize, uh, you know, the scientific-based CBD companies to invest? I mean, this stuff's not cheap. Like, no. What? So, so the what's deal the difference? is, 
you've got to develop something that you can go against pharma with. Yeah. Right. But so they're, they're going to be like the idea for most of these things is like not prescription, right? Nutraceuticals, the CBD right. stuff. Like you can go into your dispensary, you can go into Sprouts and buy this stuff. I'm talking about like, look what, what they did with Epidiolix, right? That's synthetic though. Mm -hmm. They got an FDA approval, right? Look at an example of a biotech company out there right now that's running clinical studies. And I'm actually the CRO on the diabetic neuropathy study, Zolera mm. Therapeutics. They're an Aussie company, but they're also in the United States. They're located in uh, very close in the Philadelphia suburbs. They own, they were the original founders of a triple stack MSO. So they were a grow processor dispensary. They got a license in Pennsylvania, but they were biotech people. They came from GSK initially. So they went into the cannabis space knowing that they were going to set up their facility GMP wow. from the rip. So they were different. Their, the company used to be called Ilera. They got bought. They sold, I think, 250 mil in like a year or two. And was they made a, a big chunk. But their products, their products were GMP manufactured. And their products, believe it or not, had a science base behind their the development of these products. And they're able so, to patent their particular formula. That's right. So some of them that were originally in the Ilera team moved over and then they started, they joined forces with Zelda Pharmaceuticals. Huh. And that's why it's called Zelera Therapeutics. And so they're somebody that people should pay attention to because wow. they truly are R&D people. They truly came from big pharma and they're going after indications like sleep, pain, autism, hope, mm -hmm. that's out in Australia. That was originally developed in Pennsylvania. This is all public, so I'm not saying anything I'm not allowed to say. Right. But they're the ones that are putting the best foot forward, in my opinion. They're the type of companies that we want to work with. You know, we're, we're, but you know what I'm saying? Because they're doing things right. They're worrying about patient outcomes. They worried about these patients during all these trenches of COVID we had. I was running the study in the middle of COVID. The study was going on for two years because of patient recruitment and making sure we only enrolled the right type of patients. We were very slow and steady like a turtle. But when the results come out, you'll be able to see like why so, it was so strategically based. So in those guys' case, it is prescription. That and, will be prescription. Mm -hmm. And I'm back to CVS. I mean, doesn't mean CVS is going to carry it, right? You're going to have to go to specialty pharmacy or... Oh, no, no, because it'll be approved like epidiolysis. Ah, okay, okay. Right? So it'll be like that. So they're doing the right thing. That's more That's more of what should happen. So I you see. see right now what's blowing up in the space, right? They're saying people people um, have lost money in the cannabis space. There's been inflation, artificial inflation of values of these uh -huh. big, big, big companies. People are all trying to buy in, and now everything's all messed up. They're quiet. and It's because they were spending money on the wrong things. If they would have started, think about it, Dan, if they would have started doing research when they had all this cash coming in and all these patients are coming in and buying their products, paying for cash, it's a cash business. If they took some of that money instead of buying a jet or doing what they were doing and put it into research, how much further would they be along? They wouldn't have, yes, they would still have some losses, obviously, because research is freaking expensive, but at least they were doing the right thing. Yep. I mean... It's delayed gratification. It's it's definitely risky. Uh, what is it? One out of ten trials yeah. make it to the next stage. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> can't fault them, but at the same time, you you can't. Um, they can't be mad at the other ones for doing it the right way and raising money and going public. In many cases, these are like publicly traded companies mm -hmm. that are doing this stuff. Yeah, Zell. Zalera, they're publicly traded. They're trading on the Australian market because Zelda was already publicly traded, right? So what about those joined... other big ones though? What was it? Sundial or, oh gosh, they were like penny stocks before the COVID bubble. Oh, There were so many of those. Yeah, that's oh. what I'm saying. There was like, 
I think we have uh, like Tilray. that bubble. Tilray. Tilray. There you go. Tilray. Yeah. Tilray. They I lost a lot of money on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But they were well, doing trials too, right? They were doing trials, but again, it you, you know, begs the question of who really understood. And that was the other thing. Like I would talk to these guys. Oh, we know what we're doing. Not, I'm not saying Tilray. I'm mm -hmm. not throwing, you know, shade right, on right, anybody right, right. in particular. I'm just talking in general, these people, you know, I would meet with them. I would talk to them, say, Hey, listen, we have a CRO. We'd love to work with you. This is what we do. We're burn and turn. We can do this. We know how to do it. We know how to help you with your recruitment because PS all these patients were coming through the nonprofit that were cannabis patients. Once I started working in the CRO space, right. Cause I'm one in the same, I'm the same yeah. lady. So we knew we started learning about these cannabis patients and the endocannabinoid system. And, you know, these people who have ADHD and all these problems, anxiety, all these things. So we were learning all this stuff on the APA side. So we were equipped when we showed up to talk to a pharma company because we understood in that space, we really understood. They thought they knew everything. That was part of the problem. I see. They didn't want to take our advice, like our type of advice, right? They they could do it their way. And they have their strategy it. and they were going to stick to it. Yeah, Tilray, mm -hmm. that was the one yep. um, that I'm, I invested in. Um, what, what are you excited about? Because it seems like that bubble burst and now it's, um, now we have like, the, the companies that are left uh, in the aftermath, the survivors or the new ones that learn lessons from the past. And um, what are you excited about in your space as, as far as affinity bio partners is concerned? Well, you know, we have a lot going on with the, like I said, the nutraceutical space, and we just helped um, some of these people raise funding. So um, through one of our other holding companies. So, so you think nutraceuticals are growing? Like, yeah, I'm naive in this aspect. Like, is it, are we talking about something that's going to be prescribed also? Or? Well, think about Nutrafol. Do you know what that is? The hair loss drug? Nutrafol. It's all over TV right now. I probably should use some. Okay. <laughs> I'm not seeing <laughs> it for that reason. But Nutrafol is a hair loss drug that they have for men and women, and it's been approved. I worked on Nutrafol, believe it or not. I, see. I was working in this space when I launched Biopartners in 15. Is that so prescription started, or over the counter? I think it's prescription neutral. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so they did things right, right? GMP. They follow they had real sites. You know, they did things the right way. Did it cost a lot of money? It did. But look where they are now. They got the approval. So I was working on PRP back then. So that's where I've been, you know, and I really like staying PRP, there. Does that mean, PRP, yeah, that's PRP. right. Let's yeah, talk about hair. that. Is that a growth area like PRP? Yeah, PRP totally. Because you can use PRP on a lot of different things. You can help with re hair regrowth. You can help with osteo issues with PRP. Yeah, my so, doctors here do it. My PIs, I'm at the clinic right now. I'm upstairs in the attic, but they're they're busy and they do PRP. My other PI in mm -hmm. San Bernardino, California. Hyperbaric for wound care? That's wound huge. Care. Huge. But those things, okay, so like PRP, that's not a prescription, right? That's just, you have to do it under doctor supervision. Mm -hmm. Usually they're certified or they take some classes, and mm -hmm. but you, they don't have to be either, right? Most, well, most of the people that I've worked with were real physicians in the PRP space. Right, right, real um, physicians, but like, so the, that company, whoever makes the PRP uh, product, they're not going to sell it to someone who's not trained um, no 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 not at all no no and right. they're working in various spaces whether it's osteo or it's derm a lot of them are I in see. derm with prp yeah. so and i brought up the hyperbaric stuff because the one of the clinical trial sites that we just shut down for the dn study up in pittsburgh they just put two chambers in on purpose okay. and they did it because they work with wound care patients and they will not give pain meds out they're against I see. Lyrica, GABA, Oxy, all that stuff. They, they think that the natural way, and this is a physician group, Dan. This wow. is not, and it's not a big one. You know what I'm saying? So they, I, when I was there closing them down, they were telling us they were going to put the chambers in and now the chambers are there. So I got to see the chambers. So think about like, you know, that Restore, that wellness company in front of me, Restore, it's all over the place. They're chains. 
they have hyperbaric chambers for people because it helps think about all the long hauler syndrome people with the clots is that considered and, like uh like prp or like um this other stuff is that considered nutraceutical or like what category is this well that's a device right hyperbaric because you go into a device right, right you're in right. in there and you have to be able to, you, a physician has to recommend that that will work for you right because so it's otherwise... kind of like the eeg category the same category as like eegs um mm -hmm. yeah so like, like i'm ECT, seeing a... electric combo so, yep. uh, therapy yeah yep. there's so yeah. much of this like miscellaneous that's just not your traditional device or prescription med and mm -hmm. that's basically where your zero focus is mm -hmm. on yeah yeah because it's fun it really is a, <laughs> it's so much fun like it's see... all the long tail of like nobody else wants to do it like why haven't the big guys gotten into this stuff like ppp oh, and all of them I, or do they I don't, I don't i don't know if they're working with the hyperbaric stuff and all this, you know, like, I don't know if they ended up working on Nutrafol um, eventually. But like your competitors, I, I don't know. You're, you but, don't compete with the big zeros, right? Like, you're in your no, own category. We're in our own category. <laughs> it's a weird yeah. little category. You but... got the blue ocean strategy in place there. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is this is kind of how I am as a person, right? So it's always like, you know, the, the, the koi that's what it is. it's me i'm like the koi fish going up you know that's just how it is like because i know that when i see something and i see improvement i'm that's where i want to be because i really want to help people feel better and i want to keep costs down as much as possible for these poor people these okay. patients they're messed up and they need help and and, and we need to help them well we definitely better. need more natural like solutions backed by research uh, so what's the growth area? You were saying nutraceuticals, definitely like a huge growth sector. Mm -hmm. Nutraceuticals like, is huge. But like for what, like indication, just across the board or? Across the board. There's some stuff I'm seeing that I'm like, oh my God. And these mm -hmm. are companies that want to get their products like in Whole Foods or? Or approved, you know, approved like prescription wise. To be prescribed, mm -hmm. I see. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And they want to put the product into patients' hands that need it most in the emerging areas where they can't get it. Yeah. Now you're seeing why we opened up the office in India. That was done on purpose. That's because smart. Because we want to help these people in India. Would you know, peptides like, be in this same peptides, long absolute. tail space that you're mm -hmm. in? My PI is really interested in peptides. Yep. Peptides. Mm -hmm. he loves peptides like that's all mm -hmm. he talks about mm -hmm. interesting even, i told him like there's not that much money in that peptide research let's do this ldl mm -hmm. lowering drug study yeah and he's like yeah yep. that's cool but what there's got to be someone doing research on peptides and... yeah that's one of the things that yep. i guess that's you <laughs> that's us so and it's good like when we met last time when you were on cd and we talked and, you know, I was learning all about all the new stuff you've been working on. I meant it when I said, I believe there's a lot of opportunity for us to work together because I know I don't have to worry about you or any of your people because you do things right. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're not going to enroll people that are not proper. I know that you're not going to like, oh, just because you have to check the box and you're crossing your fingers, hoping that this person doesn't cause us an AE or God forbid, an SAE. Yeah, no. You PI today things. screenfilled someone that was I thought was a shoe in for a study. He said, "Nope, he has possible gout. Look at his uric acid levels. Uh, we don't want him in the study until that's taken care of." So mm -hmm. he made a screenfill someone today on the spot. Mm -hmm. Burst my bubble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But see, you did the right thing though. Mm -hmm. You didn't push on him and say, "No, no, no. We should no, no. If they say no, they that's say his no. territory. That's it. It's that's not right. even the guy's not even his patient." He just looked at the lab and said, this is gout. So refer him back to his primary care and we can rescreen him later. We had a study coordinator um, that was working and she brought a subject in. We screened through APA, right? Got them set up. You're going to bring them in. And the person walked in and was like symptomatic, either for a heart attack or for COVID. Okay, because the study was going on during COVID, like bad during COVID. And um, 
-hmm. So she, she called me, the study coordinator, and she said, listen, this is what's going on. They didn't consent the person yet, right? They were just talking, just mm -hmm. talking. Mm -hmm. And she said, what do you want me to do about this? Because I know you guys screened through APA and the person met all inclusion, exclusion, and you guys spent a lot of time, like they're on the phone for like an hour sometimes with these patients because they're really trying to understand if there's something there we have to worry about, right? So um, I said, listen, no go. If you have a bad, bad feeling, this person is, it was a, it was a man. I said, if he is symptomatic for either COVID or you think maybe a heart attack, you don't know, tell him to go to the hospital and then he could reach back out to you and then you can get him in once, you know, if, if he passes everything, he's cool. Uh -huh. Turns out the man was having a heart attack. Wow. Wow. So if our telemonitoring had been hooked up, which is separate from the EDC and the EPRO, we yeah. would have known that guy was having a heart attack because we can tell by the biometric readouts through yeah. the wearables what's happening with these people. Mm -hmm. So the doctor who is attached to them, to that person, in this case, it would have been the study coordinator and the PI that would have this person, the telemonitoring side, would have solved the firing from the wearables and would have known they were having a heart attack, would have gotten on the phone and said, you have to go to the hospital, you're having a heart attack. Wow. This is the, <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of, we can just do like two more hours. The, <laughs> we'll have to do a part two and a part three. Yeah, it's, it's that would be. Enough. It's never enough with you. Um, because we just barely got into like nutraceuticals. Um, I'm curious about peptides because of my PI. I mm -hmm. promised him I'd find him studies. And yeah. you, you have to like go like MacGyver your way, like reverse engineer. Okay, which companies do you like? And then go to their website and try to ask them, hey, do you guys do research or we're a site? Yeah, I mean, I don't know like another to way to you. go about it. I'm just used to the traditional kind of studies, right? Like, yeah. Um, they just come to you. They look for the best sites. They come to you. But in this space, it's different, right? It's hard to find, you know, even my DNs sites, right? For this study that we fit, you know, we, we, the diabetic know, neuropathy. The mm -hmm. uh, we had to have certain types of physicians, right? Because this was a cannabinoid based treatment, I see, I see. right? No THC. It was isolate, right? So we didn't have to worry about that problem with DEA, you didn't the DEA and all that nonsense. Thank God, no. Yeah. So, but to find the right people that understand cannabis and treat patients properly, because you know how these card programs work. You come in, you go out, come in, go out, go out. They don't really spend that much time with you. I yeah. know, I have a card. And the reason why my physician spends a lot of time with me, he's my CMO. He's my chief medical officer, Brian Donner. <laughs> You've seen his name with me. He's the right kind of doctor though. You know what I mean? Nice, so nice. it made sense for him to pick up the DN study. He was the lead <laughs> PI. He's been working with me in the space since PA opened, right? Gives a whole and, new meaning to turn and burn. <laughs> it, it, for sure, for sure. So that's that's the other challenge is maybe this is a niche for you guys. So I'm serious really to focus in this nutraceutical space because yeah. I'm telling you, that is the wave of the future. As a that's what, Yep. That's what people are asking me about constantly. I have people who have products that want to get in the space because I'm a CRO and they're like, hey, um, we want to do this, blah, blah, blah. How can this, what can we do? Well, how can we do this? Yeah. And so then I get hired to help develop their pathway to get an approval for them. So if we're a site that, you know, our PIs have, he loves getting people's weight down. Like he's an internal medicine. He's got a, Yuma's biggest private practice. There's like eight other providers that work underneath him, two locations, 10,000 patients on a yearly basis that they see. Um, he loves doing our traditional studies, OA of the knee, diabetes, um, obesity. There's a lot of new obesity stuff coming out, LDL. But he loves this alternative stuff too. Mm -hmm. Like he's he uses coenzyme Q10 a lot of times. For patients like he tries to get patients off of certain drugs um mm -hmm. and so like this Ex is like a natural exosomes. inflammation exosomes, exosomes was like exosomes. another thing that we were working on in the past i'm telling you it's coming up because you know i know that it's coming so that up, hasn't right? died down the exosomes is picking back up 
It's picking back up. It's picking back up because I just I'm, I'm seeing some funding come through and the exosome stuff helps with cardiac issues, you know. So I'm waiting for that to come up, you know, like to come into our territory so that we could start doing what we need to do, which is we've got to find the right sites. You so know, how do we when you're, I guess if you were a site, like how do we position ourselves or for those watching like they just need to get in touch with you, I guess. Yeah, just get in touch with us because we keep an active site list at all times, right? Mm -hmm. And okay. a lot of times you'll see on my show, I'll bring people on, like Dr. Ty, for example. He's out of Texas. He's a, he's a chiropractor, right? He was one of the other physicians that worked on the DN stuff because he sees diabetic neuropathy patients every day, all day long. Yeah. So wow. it's hard for I have to try. So like you said, you're trying to find the sponsors that are in the space, right? That can do this stuff, right? That wants to do clinical studies. Yep. I have the hard time of trying to find the right type of sites that have that understanding because it's a different type of understanding. Yeah. Well, you're on the feasibility side and making sure it's the right fit because as a traditional site owner that has a PI interested in this alternative stuff, it's like, okay, great. Like what I'm going to spend an hour a week at the most looking for peptide companies because these big ones are giving me studies like every week, like here's a right. new survey, here's a new, so how much am I going to like explore just because it's like alternative versus hire, just... get your interns to help you with that. Yeah. yeah. That's what I would hire a nice young kid that like my kids that I just was talking about. I love these mm -hmm. kids, the six of them, <laughs> um, you know, you hire an intern couple of them and just contact are, these companies and say hey what up and like, say listen what's going on and then work on collateral to represent yourself like listen i've got a pi here that's mm -hmm. well qualified we can do this this is how we work we have all these symptoms systems in place we're not some wacko working out of a trailer we're a <laughs> real site right yeah, you know what i'm talking yeah. about yep you know yep. so and like we're talking to people right now about making mobile clinical research sites now. Well, yeah, you saw the care access things. I mean, mm -hmm. we got to do part two and three. Um, <laughs> but yeah, everybody, look, go connect with Christina. Like, the, she's obviously a wealth of infant treasure trove. We need more mm -hmm. people like you in the space oh. that focus on the non traditional pathways because it's important. Like, you know, we don't want to all be on, on medications when we don't need to be. Like a lot of people, once they get on a certain prescription med, that's it for the rest of their life. They yeah. Think that's going to be what they're on. Well, there's ways to explore and see if there's other alternatives. That's the whole Gut. point of research. Gut microbiome. That's another Sabine thing. Sabine Hazen. Yeah. You know Sabine Hazen? Um, I don't know Sabine Hazen. Oh, wow. I, I got to introduce you. Okay. That's all her. I was a okay. CRO for her uh, during COVID, actually. Okay. Um, we're a boutique, very, 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 very boutique. I don't want to be a CRO, but we have a CRO capability. Yeah. And um, yeah, we were, we helped her out during COVID. I got to put you in touch with her. Yeah, that would be awesome because that's another avenue, right? If your gut's yeah. messed up, you feel messed up. Like people think they have allergies and a lot of times it's their gut. It's their gut. Yeah. I'm on a Life Boost, right? I'm a sponsor. They're one of my sponsors, Life Boost Coffee. They got bifidobacteria mm -hmm. in their cold brew. Yeah. Like, I mean, technically, they probably don't think of themselves as a nutraceutical, but isn't that blurring the lines there? I mean, it's not prescription. You get it yeah, online. Yeah, but... it's, yeah, <laughs> it would be a nutraceutical. They've done <laughs> my research opinion. on it. They've done research, yeah. even though it's not to our standards of, you know, having a monitor and all that. Yeah, but right. They still right. do it. They still do I mean, it in-house. I did gut microbiome testing for myself. Because after I had COVID, I wanted to learn what happened with my body because it was a, there was a change, right? And so I, I worked with a group called Gut Health Agency. Um, Chelsea has actually been on my podcast. She's amazing. She's really smart. And she's all about healing the inside out, right? Like fixing what's wrong. You know, mm -hmm. her, I forget what her slogan is. Dysbiosis. Yeah, it's something about like poop matters. I think that's her hashtag poop matters. Oh, well, Dr. So Hazen <laughs> is the self-proclaimed shit queen. You would love Okay. Her. 
So yeah, I gotta meet her, and I've got to also introduce her to Chelsea because Chelsea worries about poop all the time. She probably so knows her. They probably know each I, other. It's a they small probably, world. They probably do. Mm -hmm. And so I changed. So I went on a program, four phases. I'm on phase three. I fell behind. I started in November last year, and I fell behind because my mom. I was having a lot of problems with her health and everything, and then she ended up dying. And then that was a whole can of worms. There was a lot of stuff involved with that. And so I was, I, I fell behind. Okay. Yeah. And I wasn't moving as fast across the phases. And then me as a clinical research person like you, okay, we took our baseline poop. Okay. Now what do I look at? I feel better, but where am I? So I have to do the secondary testing. Now the, the kids in my, in my bathroom downstairs in the hall <laughs> bath. So yep. I see it. So I see it. So as a matter of fact, Chelsea texted me or DM'd me on Instagram. It was like, CD, you got to get that poop test done. Okay, you gotta come go on, to the we bathroom, got, CD. We got to get you. And I said, listen, <laughs> I moved. We lost the poop box. I finally found the poop box when I unpacked this one box. It wasn't where it was supposed to be. <laughs> and I found it. So now I can take it. So I will take it again because I want to see where, I, where I'm kind of, where, did, I get, did I get better like I thought? Yeah. Or what do we need to do now? Do we need to change some things? Because I know I still feel kind of funny. But I don't know if it's because of something else that we talked about earlier. So I'm still trying to ascertain all that stuff. But gut health is where it's at. I'm no, telling this you. stuff's super interesting. Um, we're definitely going to set up a part two and part three. But Christina, look, everybody go connect with her on LinkedIn. Okay, check out her stuff. Get to know her. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you so much for having me on again. I'm very honored. Bye-bye. <laughs>